So one of the enduring questions in evolutionary biology that we've seen uh, throughout this conference in this sexual selection uh, sequence is trying to explain the evolution of female choice. Uh, so it's not like we don't have any answers to this question. We've got uh, a rich theory that's been developed and a number of discrete hypotheses for explaining female choice in male ornaments. But I think too often these um, uh, these ideas are uh, posed in isolation, so each idea has to explain the whole realm of, of ornamentation. Uh, they're often pitted against each other, and lately sometimes they've been considered actually ends of one phenomenon, so ends of a continuum. And I think there's much to be uh, gained by uh, accepting the contribution of each of the various ideas in trying to explain the really complex set of traits that we're, we're trying to explain. So let me start by outlining what I think are the dominant theories uh, to explain female mate choice in male ornaments. And none of these are my ideas, and I'm not going to present these in any detail. I'm just going to sketch them, because I think we all are pretty familiar with these, these ideas already. So there's the species recognition hypothesis. This was actually the first complete explanation for female choice in, in male ornaments that was presented. And so Alfred Wallace realized that Potentially the worst mistake a female can make is to mate outside of uh, species boundaries. And if you've gone to any of the hybridization or speciation talks that have run lately and we'll keep going through this session, you see lots of negative effects of hybridization. It's, it's generally the rule. And, and Wallace proposed that females would benefit by finding uh, uh, traits that signal species identity and then males would respond by evolving those traits. And Wallace thought that this explained basically the, the whole realm of ornamentation uh, in animals. And this idea was, was very successful. It was the uh, default explanation for sexual selection for about 80 years after Wallace presented it. I think we could all wish we had an idea that would last for 80 years. Uh, so, but eventually it fell out of favor, uh, primarily because it, it was viewed in isolation and as a complete explanation for sexual selection. It failed. It doesn't, for instance, explain the ornate plumage of a male wood duck very well. And so as the species recognition hypothesis kind of faded, and actually I think it faded too far from consideration, uh, alternative hypotheses were developed. And primarily, we have the indicator trait hypothesis and the runaway uh, sexual selection hypothesis. So just briefly, because I imagine most people in this audience are well familiar with these, with these models, the indicator trait hypothesis proposes that ornamental traits evolve as honest signals of male quality. So females prefer these traits because they gain uh, a benefit, either good genes for their offspring or direct resource benefits, and then males have the traits in response to female choice. The other uh, prominent model is the runaway model of sexual selection, and by this model, uh, ornamental traits are signals of aesthetic beauty. So they're not predicted to have any particular association with uh, viability or functionality of the male. They're uh, attractive for their own sake. So females choose these traits in order to get these traits in their sons, they have attractive sons, and then you can have the initiation of a runaway process where you get a self-reinforcing cycle, more preference leads to more ornamentation, uh, and, and so forth, and you can get very elaborate ornaments. Now, all of these traits, uh, all of these uh, models have been, uh, have been uh, worked out in detail in mathematical treatments, in logical treatments, they're very well vetted, there's empirical support, for species isolation and, uh, and indicator, not so much for, for runaway, but it's very well supported in, in mathematical models. So these are the three primary models of sexual selection that we've had around for quite a while. Of course, I'm very aware that there's other models, uh, uh, sensory exploitation, uh, 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 chase away models, and, and other models, and these could be brought in, and, and I'll show you the conceptual framework I have at the end. Other ideas could be brought in, but I think we gain a great benefit by starting from these three models that have been the focus of most evolutionary biology treatments and are broadly considered as the most likely explanations uh, for uh, ornamentation in animals. Now, one of the things that I think has been underappreciated with regard to these models is that each of these models focuses on a different uh, class of information that females will be assessing from, from females that they're choosing. So the species recognition hypothesis focuses on signals of species identity. The uh, indicator model focuses on signals of condition or quality of males, and the runaway hypothesis focuses on uh, signals of aesthetic beauty. 
these are not mutually exclusive classes of information, so they're not necessarily mutually exclusive models. Every choosing female potentially benefits by assessing each of these different classes of information in perspective maze. So I think advocating for one class of information as being so much more important than another is really counterproductive. And that's often what we're doing when we take sides in which model we like. And believe me, I did that for a long time in my career. It doesn't really lead to, to great insights. It's better to consider the models as each focusing on a different aspect of what females uh, might be assessing. So what is the evidence that females actually use uh, different classes of information in choosing mates? Well, I want to take a few minutes and, and review some older data that we have on uh, card line finches, but sort of recast it in, in, in uh, 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 a more uh, ex uh, pluralistic sort of view on this thing. So card line finches are small, colorful songbirds. Uh, their primary ornamentation is frontoid coloration, and they, uh, in different species, they either have yellow or red or, or, or somewhat variable plumage coloration. And these birds have been studied by a number of labs in North America and Europe primarily. Uh, numerous species have been studied, and if we want to sort of generalize across all of those studies, female card line finches prefer redder over yellower plumage traits and more saturated over less saturated plumage traits. That's the, that's the axis of elaboration in these ornaments. And, and my students and I were able to show this uh, clearly in house finches, uh, one of the, the card line finch species. When you give female house finches uh, a choice of males, they consistently show a choice for redder over oranger males and more saturated over less saturated males. So having done this um, uh, early in my career and being deep into the advocacy sort of thinking in terms of it's all honest advertisement and indicator and, and we don't like the Fisher model, uh, I extrapolated from this uh, experiments in house finches kind of to, to all animals, certainly all cards like finches. And I figured, you know, if, if indicator traits uh, are, are what we're looking at and females benefit by putting males to these challenges, they should always have open-ended choice. They should always choose the most elaborate male. You simply can't go wrong by, by doing anything other than choosing the brightest, reddest, biggest, best, and, and, and what have you. So in that frame of mind, Kevin McGraw and I ran um, uh, experiments with uh, uh, card line finches, and we did one experiment with uh, uh, American goldfinch, which is a, 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 a bird with a species typical uh, yellow coloration. So I think we all know what American goldfinch looks like. So we thought we would take goldfinches down this uh, elaboration trajectory and give females a choice of what we thought was a super male, a, a, a red plumage male. We colored their body plumage with art markers. And we had a clear prediction that females would prefer the, uh, the, the male with super ornamentation. But females didn't prefer males with super ornamentation. Females showed a strong preference for species typical color pattern. Even though within goldfinches, they always choose the male with the, with the orange or over the yellow or beet. When we pulled it outside of a, a species typical plumage pattern, females wanted nothing to do with it. So we ran a similar experiment with uh, pine siskins. Uh, Pine siskins have a, a, a very modest ornamentation, patches of yellow in the wing and tail. Experiments with pine siskins have shown that within their populations, they like slightly bigger patches and yellower patches, more, more intensely pigmented patches. But when we created what we thought were super males, males with the yellow extended across the whole uh, surface of the body, females wanted nothing to do with them. Females showed a strong preference for a species typical uh, plumage pattern. So from this observation, I think we can develop a, a simple model for the process of mate choice that we would see in, in, in house, in, in, well, in a choosing fish, but obviously in, in many choosing animals, we would see the same pattern of, uh, 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 of the same process. So as a female finch looks at the realm of all potential mates in the population, the first very important choice, but largely uh, uh, unappreciated choice, is she's choosing for conspecific plumage pattern. That's very important. So she eliminates all heterospecifics. And she does this by paying attention to the, the details of the, the plumage pattern. Then within the set of conspecifics, potentially correct males, you get rid of all the males, you, you eliminate as a choice all the males that have poor execution of their ornamentation, because these are males that are in, in low quality for whatever reason. Or another way to say that is you choose the males with bright red coloration. 
Okay, so how do we get highly elaborate ornaments? I haven't uh, gotten to the where aesthetic beauty comes in into this uh, process. And I don't think we have any evidence for choice for aesthetic beauty in cards like finches, but I think we see the outcome of this in, in some of the animals we're most interested in explaining, like uh, the peacock. So um, the uh, process of getting very elaborate traits, I think, begins with the end point of the first two processes, either at the end of evolution of a signal of species identity or at the end of an evolution of uh, uh, indicator trait, uh, then once you have female fixed preference for a trait in a male, that's where the uh, runaway process starts, and that's where you have the potential for high elaboration of traits. Now, I'll make the claim that this is more likely to occur with uh, uh, from the endpoint of species, I, uh, a process of evolving a single species identity, than uh, an indicator trait. Indicator traits are by definition uncheatable signals of uh, male quality. They should resist elaboration, uh, although I think there's times when they will be elaborate. I think we see the outcome of that. But in general, uh, signals of species identity, I think, are ripe to be elaborated by uh, a runaway process. So this is how I see the process occurring. Uh, in most species of animals, females will benefit by the evolution of signals of quality. So a uh, small patch of red, but it, it could be any of our, our well-established signals of quality that we know about in animals. As you get the, ch the potential to uh, mate across species boundaries, you get the evolution of uh, arbitrary and simple signals of species identity. So I just gave a slightly longer tail or slightly long, uh, elongated crest feathers. Just any arbitrary signal that unambiguously signals the species identity of the female should evolve to species recognition processes. But once we hit this point, then we've got the potential for a runaway process to then take the, the female preference for either the indicator or the um, signal of species identity and, and highly elaborate that. And since I think it's generally going to be the uh, signal of species identity, we'll take those traits and, and run them through a, a runaway process. So I think there's great value in looking at the what each of these, these processes has to, to uh, tell us about the evolution of ornamentation. So I've spent an inordinate amount of time staring at plates and field guides of animal diversity, just trying to get my head around how could this exist. So here's a plate of jungle fowl uh, from Handbook of Birds of the World. There's four species of jungle fowl in Southeast Asia with tremendous diversification of the, the plumes on the body, colors and shapes of the tail feathers. And through all of these um, species and through all the speciation, we also have the um, uh, maintenance of this um, uh, ornamentation on the head, these cones and wattles. Now, in a series of, of tremendous studies done uh, in the 80s and 90s by uh, Marlene Zuck, Randy Thornhill, and David Ligon, uh, it was shown clearly that it's the cones and wattles that are the real indicator of male condition. And the plumage traits occasionally have some relationship to condition, but in general, all those plumes and colors and the, and the feathers have no relationship to condition. So it's, it's easy to imagine how a process of uh, species identity funneling into a, a runaway process gave us the diversity of plumes, which now have no relationship to condition, and the condition-dependent trait was maintained through the speciation process. I think taking this sort of uh, multi-model approach to uh, trying to interpret ornamentation gives really new insights. In some ways, it's completely trivial. Every model I've shown you is a model well-developed in the literature. But until I started thinking about things in terms of the, the contribution of each of these models, I really couldn't even articulate an explanation for diversity of uh, ornaments in jungle fowl. Now I feel like I can. So with that, I'll be happy to take questions. for a couple questions, yes. So Jeff, would it be fair to say then that the process actually starts as a process of character displacement? Well, character displacement is going to be part of it, right. Yeah, because because the, the need to not mate outside a species boundary should be key. So character it displacement. it seems that your model, the starting point is you are in a situation where speciation has started and there's a benefit to avoiding 
resonating with the wrong species. Right, exactly. So we could look at these plays and see if can see a signal of that. In the we should see a signal for it. Right, there's testable predictions in here. With that, we better go to lunch. But if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to. Or turn on the speakers. Okay.